Welcome back to the Dusty Tome. We have a really tasty and fun treat for you today. It's a wonderful little creeper called The Frantic Frank and the Perpetual Motion Machine. It's from an up-and-coming author named Stephen Sinclair, a born and bred West Highland Scotsman whose first book is due for release in 2025. When we decided to work together, I asked him if there was anything he wanted our listeners to know about him, and he only said, Tell those folks that I've loved these types of stories all my life. Ah, a mystery then, like most things on the Dusty Tome. <laughs> a man committed to his work, not looking for ego gratification. I can respect that. With that, let's check out some of the work of this rising talent. Here is the frantic frank and the perpetual motion machine we hope you enjoy it and we'll see you on the other side the frantic frank and the perpetual motion machine part one The alchemist didn't like to think about England anymore. This was because it made him also think about his last employer. Thinking about him made the alchemist want to simultaneously get on his horse and ride into some deep woods and hide, whilst also madly needing to use the privy. He thought this was very apt, because the principality in Thuringia, where he now lived, consisted, by and large, of both these things, in his opinion. The entire place was backwards and wretched. The great peasant rebellion was still just within living memory. The poor devils had wrongly believed that Luther's teachings would get them a better life. They had made the mistake of hoping for something, and when it didn't materialize, they had risen. His current employer's grandfather had crushed them without mercy. And been congratulated by Luther for doing so. In parts of the principality, they were still locked up in barns in the evenings as if they were beasts of burden. Whilst not giving a fig about this one way or the other, the alchemist could understand the sentiment of wishing to escape from the place. He stayed mainly because it was a good hiding spot. More importantly, the prince was his employer and patron. Men like him could not live without a patron. The prince was a tow-headed, jug-eared, spotty-faced little pig of 18. When he laughed, he brayed like a donkey with a German accent. Usually he laughed at the misfortunes of others that he had inflicted, but he was a patron for the alchemist. Also, an idiot. This was useful. Mainly men like the alchemist were really employed to make flashes of fire and colored smoke at social gatherings in the castles of nobles. And to talk about the things and forces virtually all people believed lurked unseen in their world. A world devoid of even the notion of electric light. A still dark world. And still over huge areas empty of humans and human understanding to talk about these things well and look the part. The alchemist was good at this. There were of course other things, base metal into gold, the elixir of life, the language of the angels. Here, he and his kind walked a tightrope. They could not promise too much or too little. The alchemist had promised too much. Part two. Our alchemist often felt sorry for himself, whilst not knowing exactly what the problem was. His basic callousness to other people was mainly driven by fear, as it usually is. So he had long since forgiven himself and made himself comfortably indifferent. So it wasn't that. The truth was something that he didn't have the courage to face. He was a brilliant man who was just not quite a genius. He just fell short of the mark. 
and join the rest of most of us, the bungled and the botched. He had almost stumbled on the law of the conservation of liquid and almost discovered the law of the conservation of energy. But he was just slightly less than a genius. Also, like so many of his fellows, Aristotle's long dead hand still weighed heavy, restricting his mind. What made it worse was that he had the maddening knowledge that he was missing things that were just out of reach. This is why he decided to cheat. That and simple survival. Part 3 He had been talking to the prince one evening. The alchemist had been giving forth about how the element Earth naturally wanted to settle in its proper place, just as fire, air, and water wanted to settle into theirs. Naturally. In the case of Earth, this was to fall through air and settle on the ground in hollow places. They had both been rather drunk and the alchemist had desperately tried to explain that he suspected that there was something else at work. Something. A kind of universal unifying force. This was undoubtedly the alchemist's greatest moment of almost greatness. Nobody had until then suspected that such a thing as gravity existed. But he explained the concept badly, and he didn't fully grasp his own idea anyway. The prince had given his horrible brain laugh, <laughs> uncomprehending. Partly to save face, and partly because he forgot to be cautious, the alchemist had mentioned that it might be possible to trick nature. By using substances that consisted of mainly earth, and therefore wanted to fall, you might make them fight. Try and countermatch each other, and with a system of cunning counterweights create a movement that would be unending. A perpetual motion machine. It would, so the theory went, go on moving by itself forever, unless outside forces stopped it. And a big machine could power the movement of other things. The prince had been widely enthusiastic. He pointed out that he had plenty of iron ore in my mines in the thinning world house. But no good rivers to turn the lays and drive the bellows. Plenty of taunts from the mountains but they fail after a month or two. We must then sell the metal to others to work, and we are robbed. I've always believed the way to riches for us is to make the principality the big producer of cannons. They would come from everywhere, and I am a forward-looking fellow. I would even be happy for the Sultan and the Tsar to be my good customers. This didn't surprise the alchemist. Who knew what a little swine the prince was? You, sir, said the prince, will make me a perpetual motion machine. We will then make others and become the great producer of guns. You will not simply promise, you will do. The alchemist had seen a certain look come into his employer's little blue and too close together eyes. I am aware that my little country does not please you. Perhaps you find us dull. It is of no importance. If you succeed within the next 12 months, after that you can leave us with a purse of gold and our best wishes. You will not be closely watched, unless you feel it necessary to go near the frontier. However, if you don't succeed, you will be taken to the dungeons and introduced to a machine that most certainly does work. Something left over from the unhappy time when we were still under the Babylon church. It was used by the Inquisition. It's called the Judas Cradle. A silly maid who rejected compliments I wished to give her maid its acquaintance only the other day. Only it rocks men to sleep in a different way. We will see if this creates for you another unifying force. I do not like people who think they know things the great ancients didn't. Make me like you again. The alchemist knew exactly what a Judas Cradle was. He had no wish to see one. He still thought the prince was a fool, but not, unfortunately, a big enough one. He set to work the next day. Part 4 The alchemist couldn't do it. 
He realized he was going to cast about for ways to do it and still not be able to make the thing. So he called upon his occult knowledge and found a means that wouldn't trick nature so much as avoid her altogether. Part 5 There was a little type of devil. Its real name was a Diablo Perpetu Agonia. A little devil of perpetual agony. The peasant's name for it was a frantic Frank. At one time, they had been common all over Europe. It was one of those demons that inflicted the same horrible wounds again and again in the souls of the damned. Wounds that instantly rehealed, only to be inflicted again for all eternity. Perpetually. It was said that the Dutch master Hieronymus Bosch had once painted one in the background of one of his works. About the size of a small dog, it had the body of a hairy black spider with red stripes. The head on this body looked like the nightmare offspring of a cat and a toad. Atop the spider body was what looked like a rider, but it was in fact part of the same creature. This looked like a little lizard man dressed in a tiny likeness of a Roman soldier's armor. The fang-filled mouth turned down in a horrible mockery of regret. Its red eyes burned with glee. These eyes ran eternally with green tears of pus. It was said to hold a little sword. With this, it did its unending work. Apparently, the greater demons would sometimes snatch one up and let it loose in the world, as a kind of demonic version of ratting. Virtually mindless, the little demon became maniacally confused and agitated when taken away from its proper task, hence its peasant name. It would run back and forth, up and down, unendingly. They were said to kill everything in their paths, usually by cutting off their victims' heads. When these didn't instantly regrow, it got really angry and tore them to shreds. They were said to be completely mute. Usually they only appeared for a short time. The alchemist was clever. He had once read in The Book of the Toad the spell for calling one of them up. If he used his skill and knowledge, he could, he was very sure, trap one and make it run on a treadmill. Because it was a supernatural being, it would, he reasoned, never stop. He would hide the wheel and the eternally running demon inside a box. The eternally running little devil would turn a crankshaft that cunningly emerged from said box. A frantic Frank was reputed to be incredibly strong. He could make the prince an impressively big perpetual motion machine. Part 6 The spell involved catching 33 robins. This had been time consuming, but not impossible. He bribed some of the castle servants to help him. He had no intention of having a close look at the Judas Cradle. The little birds then had their legs, beaks, and wings tied tightly with the hair from a donkey's mane. He then put them inside small cages and let them starve. These birds and cages he then buried in shallow holes under trees all over the surrounding district, carefully marking the trees with ominous cryptic symbols written in the donkey's blood. All the time whispering the old saying, a robin red breast in a cage puts all heaven in a rage. He had already by this time completed the machine. The treadmill inside the box was also covered with esoteric symbols. These written in red and black ink were binding charms to keep the frantic Frank trapped in place. He was able to hide some of these preparations in plain view. It was expected of a man in his profession to do strange and inexplicable things. He was perfectly cognizant of the fact that some of the strange marks on the trees, the cages and birds would be noticed, and what this would cause to happen. The local Protestant clergy were a particularly bigoted and miserable lot, mainly second and third generation. They were still filled with their father's and grandfather's bitterness. Arriving in the Principality to do great things, these men had discovered what all such discovered. The peasants were so ignorant they made a mockery of all the divine's elaborate training and hopes. 
The local people could not even be called Catholics any more than they could be called pagans. In the proper, explicable sense, the idealistic young men understood these words to mean. The alchemist remembered a conversation he had with an old, drunk Lutheran pastor. Nothing but rank superstition, sir. Nothing. There was nothing to hit, so to speak. They thought the virgin was the trinity's wife, not even any hidden altars to the old gods in the woods. Buggers didn't even have the energy or the brains. None of this had surprised the alchemist. Nor was he now surprised when they called in the witch hunters because of the dead birds and the strange marks. And when the fires of burnings began to rise from the villages, he didn't care. Anyway, he said to himself, I'm busy. Part 7 To make the machine extra impressive, he attached a huge chain that lowered and raised a stone block. The wheel on the outside was hung with more chains that ended in heavy cannonballs. These, he told the princes, were the counterweights. They did, in fact, absolutely nothing. Except look like cleverness. Inside the box, the alchemist claimed there was a huge clockwork mechanism. He drew up elaborate plans of this supposed wonder. In those days, clocks still had no hands and only ranged the hour. They were still considered what would now be called high technology. He said that opening the box would disturb it disastrously and stop the movement. He had successfully trapped a frantic Frank on the treadmill. After the preparations, the actual ritual was easy. The alchemist had climbed up a ladder and looked through a peephole he'd made. He had almost been sick at the sight, almost collapsed. He had to drink an entire jug of strong wine. It had been busily scuttling on the wheel, crying its horrible tears. These splattered steaming against the wood and disappeared. The demon was bigger than he thought it would be. Fortunately, the wheel was big enough. Before the prince and the other fools discovered the truth, he would be long gone. All the fuss and excitement would help his escape. Part 8 Conclusion The prince had given him his gold. He had presented the prince with the machine's supposed plans. His employer insisted that he stay till the end of the week. He had invited all his nobles, clergy, and richer burgesses to the castle to inspect the new marvel where it stood in the huge hall the alchemists had used as a workroom, so they could celebrate and compliment their lord on his wisdom and farsightedness. They had arrived and been ushered en masse into the room where the huge machine clanked and turned in its endless motion, a wonder of science and a beautiful example of divine and natural Protestant magic, unsullied by the wicked false sorcery of the past. Their sycophantic praise had been a torrent. They had genuinely been amazed. Unfortunately, there was, of course, something the alchemists had overlooked. Although a frantic Frank's unnatural satanic green tears disappear, they don't do this instantly. They are also slightly acidic. These had now eaten away some of the warding charms that kept it imprisoned. It happened suddenly. Like a bullet from a gun, the imp exploded from the box. Bits of shattered timber beams blocked the only doorway. Streaking about the room at quicksilver speed, the frantic Frank raced about, chopping off heads. Blood fountained everywhere. It became enraged when these heads didn't grow back like they were supposed to. The place became a charnel house of the Principality's grandees. The little devil wasn't discriminating. It chopped off the prince and the alchemist's heads along with all the others. Then it disappeared in a puff of green smoke. The perpetual motion machine was still. The end. Wow! It turns out Frank really was frantic. I'm crossing that guy off my list of demons I'm going to summon with the kids for fun.
<laughs> I really love that little ditty, so let's inspire the mysterious Mr. Sinclair to return to the Dusty Tome and leave him a comment below letting him know your thoughts on the frantic Frank and the perpetual motion machine. Thanks to Steven for a wonderful collaboration, and thank you for listening. Please like and subscribe if you enjoyed the content today. It really helps our little channel to keep doing what it's doing. And we'll see you next time we open up the Dusty Tome. <laughs>